Now open your question paper and look at part one. Part one. You will hear part of a lecture on art and culture in the Indonesian island of Bali. Last week, we looked at the traditional art of Japan. In this week's lecture, we're going to move south and look at the very special way in which art has developed in the beautiful island of Bali, which is now part of Indonesia. I'll begin by giving you a brief historical overview. It's thought that the first inhabitants of Bali were farmers who arrived around 3000 BC, at the beginning of the Iron Age. They probably originally came from China, and in Bali they cultivated rice and built temples ornamented with wood and stone carvings and statues. The Hindu religion was introduced in the 14th century AD, and this has remained the main religion on the island. This was an important period in the artistic development of the island, when sculptors, poets, priests and painters worked together in the service of the ruling families. Rather than painting everyday scenes, artists concentrated on narrative paintings illustrating the epic stories of Hinduism. Bali's rich natural resources have always made it an alluring goal for merchants, and from the 17th century onwards, Dutch ships visited the island to trade in spices and luxury goods. Gradually, the old royal families lost their power, and eventually, in 1906, the Dutch East Indies Company was founded, and the island became a colony. In the 20th century, art then took on a very different role, as a tool accessible to everyone in the fight of the Balinese people against colonization, rather than as the property of a minority. Shortly after this, in the 1920s, stories of the beauty of the island of Bali began to spread around the world, and Balinese art underwent another vast transformation with the advent of tourism to the island. At first, this was only on a small scale, but it had important effects. Expatriate artists from Holland and Germany settled on the island, bringing paper, Chinese ink and other new materials with them. They worked with local artists, encouraging them to experiment with concepts like naturalism, expressionism, light and perspective, as well as to move away from the traditional focus on narrative painting towards something closer to their own experience. When independence came in 1945, this desire for an art to match a new national identity became stronger and the traditional narrative paintings started to give way to scenes showing the everyday life of the Balinese people, harvests, market scenes and daily tasks, as well as the myths and legends of their history. Now listen again. Last week we looked at the traditional art of Japan, in this week's lecture, we're going to move south and look at the very special way in which art has developed in the beautiful island of Bali, which is now part of Indonesia. I'll begin by giving you a brief historical overview. It's thought that the first inhabitants of Bali were farmers who arrived around 3000 BC, at the beginning of the Iron Age. They probably originally came from China, and in Bali they cultivated rice and built temples ornamented with wood and stone carvings and statues. The Hindu religion was introduced in the 14th century AD, and this has remained the main religion on the island. This was an important period in the artistic development of the island, when sculptors, poets, priests and painters worked together in the service of the ruling families. Rather than painting everyday scenes, artists concentrated on narrative paintings illustrating the epic stories of Hinduism.
Bali's rich natural resources have always made it an alluring goal for merchants, and from the 17th century onwards, Dutch ships visited the island to trade in spices and luxury goods. Gradually, the old royal families lost their power, and eventually, in 1906, the Dutch East Indies Company was founded, and the island became a colony. In the 20th century, art then took on a very different role, as a tool accessible to everyone in the fight of the Balinese people against colonization, rather than as the property of a minority. Shortly after this, in the 1920s, stories of the beauty of the island of Bali began to spread around the world, and Balinese art underwent another vast transformation with the advent of tourism to the island. At first, this was only on a small scale, but it had important effects. Expatriate artists from Holland and Germany settled on the island, bringing paper, Chinese ink and other new materials with them. They worked with local artists, encouraging them to experiment with concepts like naturalism, expressionism, light and perspective, as well as to move away from the traditional focus on narrative painting towards something closer to their own experience. When independence came in 1945, this desire for an art to match a new national identity became stronger and the traditional narrative paintings started to give way to scenes showing the everyday life of the Balinese people, harvests, market scenes and daily tasks, as well as the myths and legends of their history. Part 2 You will hear a dialogue between a PE teacher and an administrator at a summer school. Excuse me, I've come to inquire about your summer school courses. My name's Paddy Deans. Please call me Paddy. OK, Paddy. I'm at your disposal. Are you talking about concentrating on one subject? Or do you want to study a number of different subjects? And are we talking about graduate studies or a preparation for graduate studies? We can also give you advice on a new career, but we're not in the field of business management or anything like that. No, nothing like that. I was more interested in your sports programmes. You see, I'm a PE teacher and I've just got a new post. There's no compulsion to do this, but I really want to improve on my teaching and coaching techniques, if you see what I mean. I believe you have an excellent swimming programme, for example. That's right. Most of our instructors reached international level. Our course is designed to enhance the technical aspects of stroke, training and the strategy for each participant. Technical instruction, stretching and dry land training, training principles and stroke development are integral parts of the programme. So it's for someone who's reached a good standard of swimming. Each athlete will be videotaped and receive a DVD with stroke analysis. That sounds just what I'm looking for. What will I need for the course? Swimming trunks, towels, swim cap, flippers, goggles and a pillow and bed linen for the week. Right, I understand. Now, would there be any chance of taking part in equestrian events? My new school is horse riding mad, and to be honest, I've never sat on a horse in my life, although I like horses. Well, you've come to the right place, Paddy, and naturally we can provide a horse for you. We have a very well-respected equestrian camp. And don't worry if you're a complete beginner, there are no end of other people in your shoes this year for some reason. What sort of thing would I do? Well, the beginners would start off with basic horsemanship how to sit on a horse, how to make it obey simple instructions, you know. But don't worry, one of our instructors will have a long chat with you and define realistic goals. Are you interested in dressage, flat work or show jumping? To be honest, I haven't the faintest idea. That's fine. You can watch the experienced riders and try a bit of everything. I'm sure something will grab your fancy. Great. By the way, what's the enrolment deadline for all this? Well, we've just extended it by a week, so it's now May 2nd. Fine. Now listen again. You will hear a dialogue between a PE teacher and an administrator at a summer school. Excuse me. I've come to inquire about your summer school courses. My name's Paddy Deans. Please call me Paddy. OK, Paddy. I'm at your disposal. Are you talking about concentrating on one subject? Or do you want to study a number of different subjects? And are we talking about graduate studies or a preparation for graduate studies? We can also give you advice on a new career, 
but we're not in the field of business management or anything like that. No, nothing like that. I was more interested in your sports programmes. You see, I'm a PE teacher and I've just got a new post. There's no compulsion to do this, but I really want to improve on my teaching and coaching techniques, if you see what I mean. I believe you have an excellent swimming programme, for example. That's right. Most of our instructors reached international level. Our course is designed to enhance the technical aspects of stroke, training and the strategy for each participant. Technical instruction, stretching and dry land training, training principles and stroke development are integral parts of the programme. So it's for someone who's reached a good standard of swimming. Each athlete will be videotaped and receive a DVD with stroke analysis. That sounds just what I'm looking for. What will I need for the course? Swimming trunks, towels, swim cap, flippers, goggles and a pillow and bed linen for the week. Right, I understand. Now, would there be any chance of taking part in equestrian events? My new school is horse riding mad. And to be honest, I've never sat on a horse in my life. Although I like horses. Well, you've come to the right place, Paddy. And naturally, we can provide a horse for you. We have a very well-respected equestrian camp. And don't worry if you're a complete beginner. There are no end of other people in your shoes this year for some reason. What sort of thing would I do? Well, the beginners would start off with basic horsemanship. How to sit on a horse, how to make it obey simple instructions, you know. But don't worry, one of our instructors will have a long chat with you and define realistic goals. Are you interested in dressage, flat work or show jumping? To be honest, I haven't the faintest idea. That's fine. You can watch the experienced riders and try a bit of everything. I'm sure something will grab your fancy. Great. By the way, what's the enrolment deadline for all this? Well, we've just extended it by a week, so it's now May 2nd. Fine. Now turn to part three. Good afternoon. This is Kathy Holmes in our program Young and Brainy. Today I'm going to be speaking to Ryan Patterson, a teenager whose invention may bridge the communication gap between the deaf and those that can hear. Ryan, tell us how it all started. It was two years ago. I was waiting to be served at our local Burger King, and I noticed a group of customers using sign language to place an order. They were obviously deaf. Mm -hmm. They communicated with a speaking interpreter, and he relayed their choices to a cashier. I thought it would make things easier if they had an electronic interpreter instead. I remembered the idea later, when I was thinking of a new project for a science competition. I called it Sign Language Translator. It consists of a glove which is lined with ten sensors. The sensors detect the hand positions that are used to shape the alphabet of American Sign Language. Then a microprocessor transmits the information to a small portable receiver. The receiver has a screen similar to those on cell phones, and this screen displays the words letter by letter. In this way, people can read the words, even if they don't understand sign language, and people who use sign language can communicate without an interpreter. Are you impressed? So were judges at the 2001 Siemens Science and Technology Competition. The project received top honors, along with a $100,000 college scholarship for the young inventor. And now Ryan's project is already patented. Ryan, how long did you experiment with the invention before you finally produced the prototype? Around nine months. I started with researching how sign language works. Then I had to figure out how to translate all that electronically. Fortunately, I've always had an interest in electronics. I've liked wiring things together since I was four years old. <laughs> I also had hands-on experience from my part-time job at a robotic equipment lab. Did you have problems finding appropriate materials? I'm used to hunting for hardware to build competition robots. But for this project, I also had to try on many different gloves. A golf glove turned out to be the best solution. It's soft and flexible and fits closely. Mm -hmm. According to the National Institute of Deafness, one to two million people in the U.S. are profoundly deaf and most of them use sign language to communicate. Will your invention make an impact? There was a demonstration at our local deaf community center, and the people were interested. 
What I have now isn't ready for production. I'm sure it'll be very different by the time it's actually manufactured. But I do hope to see it on the market one day. Now listen again. Now turn to part three. Good afternoon. This is Kathy Holmes in our program, Young and Brainy. Today, I'm going to be speaking to Ryan Patterson, a teenager whose invention may bridge the communication gap between the deaf and those that can hear. Ryan, tell us how it all started. It was two years ago. I was waiting to be served at our local Burger King, and I noticed a group of customers using sign language to place an order. They were obviously deaf.、Mm -hmm. They communicated with a speaking interpreter, and he relayed their choices to a cashier. I thought it would make things easier if they had an electronic interpreter instead. I remembered the idea later when I was thinking of a new project for a science competition. I called it Sign Language Translator. It consists of a glove which is lined with ten sensors. The sensors detect the hand positions that are used to shape the alphabet of American Sign Language. Then a microprocessor transmits the information to a small portable receiver. The receiver has a screen similar to those on cell phones, and this screen displays the words letter by letter. In this way, people can read the words, even if they don't understand sign language, and people who use sign language can communicate without an interpreter. Are you impressed? So were judges at the 2001 Siemens Science and Technology Competition. The project received top honors, along with a $100,000 college scholarship for the young inventor. And now Ryan's project is already patented. Ryan, how long did you experiment with the invention before you finally produced the prototype? Around nine months. I started with researching how sign language works. Then I had to figure out how to translate all that electronically. Fortunately, I've always had an interest in electronics. I've liked wiring things together since I was four years old. <laughs> I also had hands-on experience from my part-time job at a robotic equipment lab. Did you have problems finding appropriate materials? I'm used to hunting for hardware to build competition robots, but for this project, I also had to try on many different gloves. A golf glove turned out to be the best solution. It's soft and flexible and fits closely.、Mm、hmm. According to the National Institute of Deafness, one to two million people in the U.S. are profoundly deaf, and most of them use sign language to communicate. Will your invention make an impact? There was a demonstration at our local deaf community center, and the people were interested. What I have now isn't ready for production. I'm sure it'll be very different by the time it's actually manufactured, but I do hope to see it on the market one day. Now listen to the fourth part of the test. First, you have some time to look at questions. Now we are ready to start. Even if you have never watched the sky at night. You probably know what you would see if you did. The view is best on a night with no moon. You stare upwards into the inky blackness, over which are scattered millions of tiny points of light. These, of course, are the stars. Then, just as you're beginning to get bored with this unchanging scene, a tiny white streak of light shoots across the sky. It's going too fast to be a plane. Then two seconds later, you see another one. What you are witnessing is the beginning of a shower of meteors or shooting stars. To understand what is happening, it helps us to imagine a car driving fast along the road. In a way, our planet Earth is like that car. As it is racing along, it comes towards a large group of insects, all flying together just above the road. Now. Not all the insects are hit by the car, but several of them crash into the car's windscreen with an unpleasant noise.
In many ways, the meteors are similar to the swarm of insects, although they aren't really animals. In fact, meteors are mostly tiny pieces of iron that look like little stones. In a similar way, the Earth is not really moving along a road, but it does follow the same circular route around the Sun once every year. This enormous circular path is called the Earth's orbit. All the other planets are in orbits like this as well. Now, there are small groups of those stones waiting in certain places along the Earth's route around the Sun. Some of them are fixed in one orbit, while others are moving around the Sun in their own orbits. Once every year, the Earth's circular path around the Sun takes us through some of these groups of little rocks. Now, when the Earth approaches one of these stones, it is pulled downwards towards our planet by a strong force called gravity. And when the meteor starts to rush towards the ground, a shooting star is born. Normally, as shooting stars fall, they are travelling at speeds of 10 kilometres every second. This is about 100 times faster than a jet plane. However, before the meteor can reach the Earth, it must go through the air around it, the atmosphere. Now, because it is going through the air so fast, the shooting star starts to become hotter and hotter, and the air around it gets very hot too. This is a bit like the head of a match rubbing along the side of a matchbox. Now, very soon, the outside of this piece of iron gets very hot indeed, and as a result, it gets soft and melts and then starts to burn. So as this hot little rock rushes through the atmosphere, it leaves a tail of hot burning metal and flames behind it. This is the bright streak we can see from the ground, 100 kilometres below. Yes, you see, fortunately for us, most meteors are so small that they have completely burnt up long before they could ever reach the ground. Which is just as well, because otherwise we would need to carry rather stronger umbrellas. Now you'll hear the recording again. Even if you have never watched the sky at night, you probably know what you would see if you did. The view is best on a night with no moon. You stare upwards into the inky blackness over which are scattered millions of tiny points of light. These, of course, are the stars. Then, just as you're beginning to get bored with this unchanging scene, a tiny white streak of light shoots across the sky. It's going too fast to be a plane. Then, two seconds later, you see another one. What you are witnessing is the beginning of a shower of meteors or shooting stars. To understand what is happening, it helps us to imagine a car driving fast along the road. In a way, our planet Earth is like that car. As it is racing along, it comes towards a large group of insects all flying together just above the road. Now, not all the insects are hit by the car but several of them crash into the car's windscreen with an unpleasant noise. In many ways, the meteors are similar to the swarm of insects, although they aren't really animals. In fact, meteors are mostly tiny pieces of iron that look like little stones. In a similar way, the Earth is not really moving along a road, but it does follow the same circular route around the Sun once every year. This enormous circular path is called the Earth's orbit. All the other planets are in orbits like this as well. Now, there are small groups of those stones waiting in certain places along the Earth's route around the Sun. Some of them are fixed in one orbit, while others are moving around the Sun in their own orbits. Once every year, the Earth's circular path around the Sun takes us through some of these groups of little rocks. Now, when the Earth approaches one of these stones, it is pulled downwards towards our planet by a strong force called gravity. And when the meteor starts to rush towards the ground, a shooting star is born. 
Normally, as shooting stars fall, they are travelling at speeds of 10 kilometres every second. This is about 100 times faster than a jet plane. However, before the meteor can reach the Earth, it must go through the air around it, the atmosphere. Now, because it is going through the air so fast, the shooting star starts to become hotter and hotter, and the air around it gets very hot too. This is a bit like the head of a match rubbing along the side of a matchbox. Now very soon the outside of this piece of iron gets very hot indeed, and as a result it gets soft and melts and then starts to burn. So as this hot little rock rushes through the atmosphere, it leaves a tail of hot burning metal and flames behind it. This is the bright streak we can see from the ground. 100 kilometers below. Yes, you see, fortunately for us, most meteors are so small that they have completely burnt up long before they could ever reach the ground, which is just as well because otherwise we would need to carry rather stronger umbrellas. That's the end of the test.